Thank you everyone for joining us today for the National Social Anxiety Center Clinical Education Seminar. My name is Taylor Wilmer and I'm an associate and board member for the National Social Anxiety Center and clinical director at Instride Health. I'm pleased to introduce our speaker today, Dr. Corinne Gatarizzoli. Dr. Gatarizzoli is a licensed clinical psychologist and assistant professor of psychology at Weill Cornell Medical Center and an assistant attending psychologist at New York Presbyterian Hospital. She earned her doctoral degree in clinical psychology from Fairleigh Dickinson University, and she completed her clinical internship at Montefiore Medical Center. Dr. Caterizzoli specializes in cognitive behavioral therapy and exposure and response prevention for anxiety disorders, as well as pediatric psychology and the application of behavioral health interventions for children and adolescents coping with acute or chronic medical illnesses. Dr. Caterizzoli currently works at the Weill Cornell Specialty Center and the Youth Anxiety Center, where she provides a variety of clinical services, including diagnostic assessments, therapy, and consultation. Today, Dr. Caterizzoli will be talking to us about social anxiety and chronic medical illnesses. Um, and as a reminder, we'll save the last few minutes for questions and discussions. And if you have questions in the middle of the presentation, feel free to send those directly to me and I can share them at the end. Thank you so much for being here with us today. And I'll hand it over now to Dr. Caterizzoli. Thank you, Taylor. And it's so nice to be here with everybody today. I'm at Wall Cornell Medicine in New York City. And I'm excited to speak today about the intersection between social anxiety and chronic illness. So I hope in our time today, we'll be able to cover a bit about the co-occurrence of anxiety in general and medical illness or medical issues, and then speak more specifically about this intersection between social anxiety specifically and a variety of acute and chronic medical illnesses. And I'm gonna be using GI disorders as an example framework for some of these concepts as we go through, um, just to sort of illustrate and bring to life a lot of what we're talking about. And then finally, we'll get to applying CBT in the context of social anxiety and medical illness to make it uh, have some kind of concrete ideas on how to use this framework. So to start off, it's worth noting that rates of anxiety disorders in patients with medical illnesses are high. This might not be surprising, but when you look at the numbers, they're actually pretty jarring when you can compare um, them to the general population that presents with anxiety. So nearly half of patients with MS have an anxiety disorder, 47% of patients with diabetes, 30% of patients with Parkinson's, 30% of patients with cardiovascular disease, 29% of patients with epilepsy, and I'm sure we could keep going on and on. And then interestingly, vice versa is also true. So when you're looking at groups of patients with anxiety disorders, there are disproportionately high rates of medical illnesses that are found. So this is a little bit of a chicken and an egg. Is it that folks who have a medical condition are more prone to developing anxiety because of the stressors that go along with that? Or is it something about having anxiety that makes one vulnerable to developing a medical illness? And we really think about it as bi-directional and an intersectional process that we'll talk more about. But in the group of patients with anxiety disorders, like you said, the high rates of medical illness are found. And then anxiety is associated with things such as unexplained medical symptoms, really high rates of medical and healthcare utilization, and lower health-related quality of life, physical disability, functional impairment, et cetera. So when we think about anxiety and chronic illness, why are these two so associated? Why do they go together? Well, we know anxiety is when we have something that we fear that is threatening or that we evaluate as dangerous to us. And with a chronic medical illness or an acute medical illness, there is a very clear threat. Um, there are dangerous stimuli that folks are facing on a regular basis, like seizures or asthma attacks, um, things that are scary. And along with that, there's also a high rate of just distressing procedural um, experiences that they have to go through, injections, MRIs, endoscopies, 
along with medications that have unpleasant side effects. So again, put when you layer that on, it makes sense that that would increase the incidence of anxiety in this group. And then the real, you know, most threatening um, stimuli that many of these patients might be facing, particularly with right, life-threatening illness, their death. Um, so again, it makes a lot of sense. Two other common themes that uh, individuals who have a medical issue face are unpredictability. So they're not sure the course of their symptoms, how things will progress. Um, if they have a illness that tends to have exacerbations or flares, they might feel like they don't know when those will occur. Um, there's a lot of unknown. Will this recur? Will this stay in remission? So um, this all really points to this lack of control and lack of um, ability to know what to expect. And also a lot of you know, decreased ability to control the environment, the medical environment, the hospital is one in which there's a huge loss of control. You think about this oftentimes for our children who are here in the hospital on our medical floors, they never know, and true for adults as well, who's going to walk in the door of their room, at what time, what that person will do, if that will involve something painful. So again, a real loss of control. And all of these things really contribute to the development and maintenance of anxiety. Another interesting aspect of folks who have co-occurring issues is this idea that many physical symptoms that are associated with a you know, whole variety of medical illnesses mimic those that occur with anxiety. So for example, shortness of breath, something that we commonly see in asthma and something that we commonly see with anxiety or panic. So it can be really difficult for patients and even providers sometimes to differentiate what is a dangerous sign, a dangerous sensation that needs to be attended to and responded to versus what is just uncomfortable but not dangerous or threatening, what is due to anxiety. Um, it can be hard for folks to really differentiate. We see this with abdominal pain quite a bit. Obviously, that's one of our more common somatic symptoms of anxiety. And then also a common symptom of many GI disorders like IBS or IBD, et cetera. Heart palpitations with cardiac conditions is a big one where we see folks coming in a lot and, and doing a lot of care seeking and medical utilization over concerns of that somatic symptom. Um, and there's just this, this big overlap with anxiety. Headaches, again, a very common stress-related symptom, um, but could also be due to migraines or some other neurological condition. So this makes it a little bit tricky to assess and to know when to intervene and what type of intervention to use. So to move to speak more specifically about social anxiety and chronic illness, there are a number of different themes that we see come up. The, the first and foremost is just the sense of feeling different, feeling judged, feeling alienated, and feeling lonely. So we know, you know, at the crux of social anxiety is that core fear of negative evaluation of others. And for folks with a medical illness, they have sort of an amplified view or amplified feeling about how others may be viewing them, perceiving them, or judging them. For our younger kids, there's, and, and really for adults alike, there's this risk of peer rejection, this idea that they um, will be accepted for having this chronic condition, especially if it's something that's more rare or misunderstood. And then oftentimes illness disrupts things, disrupts activities, school, work, and other areas of functioning, which gets in the way with socialization. So for kids who are have extended absences from school, it's hard to really get ingrained into the rhythm of, and the social dynamics of a classroom or a school, um, as well as can have that appropriate development that goes on, social skills development that goes along with that. And again, same for, um, for older folks as well. And then there are many restrictions, real restrictions that go along with a variety of different medical illnesses, whether it's due to pain or um, immune status. 
and um, these can get in the way with what a person can participate in and can partake and can lead to a lot of avoidance if they're worried about their ability to participate in something. And then lastly is the most sort of visible area of illness, which is appearance, where there's a lot of self-consciousness or embarrassment associated with a number of different symptoms that result in changes to appearance. So it could be hair loss associated with chemotherapy or dermatological changes that are visible to others um, or medical equipment that's required, things like an ostomy bag or an insulin pump, where there's oftentimes a lot of fear that others will pay a lot of attention to it, will think that it's strange, in some way judge it um, and can lead to avoidance of social situations for that reason. I also wanted to make a note for anybody that works with um, with younger kids or adolescents that parents have a, a role in this as well with kind of the development and maintenance of social anxiety where we know parents of sick children tend to be more overprotective um, and have that type of parenting style, which makes a lot of sense. You know, they're trying to protect their child. They've been through a lot of stressors or even trauma with their child. Um, and we tend to see that pattern uh, continue with them. And as we all know, that kind of sh trying to shield them or protect them might inadvertently promote anxiety symptoms because it sends this message that, no, you can't cope with this situation. It's not safe. You need somebody else there to help you or take care of you. You can't do this independently. So for example, you see a lot of children with medical illnesses like epilepsy who their parents won't let them go on sleepovers. They're worried about what will happen um, if nobody's monitoring them actively um, or children with type 1 diabetes. Um, parents are worried about what will happen if no one's there kind of watching their numbers overnight. Um, and so we can talk later about, you know, this is a clearly an intervention point, but the messaging that sends to children about their ability to cope and about the nature of their illness and, um, and how much it defines them. And then this other pattern we see with parenting is avoidance, talking about an illness. Um, again, all well-intentioned to try to shield their child from anything that could be scary or from feeling or from feeling like they're different, but often it has almost a backfire effect where kids are smart, they're perceptive, they can tell that something's not being said, and they either A, worry that it's actually worse than it really is, that something horrible is happening, um, and catastrophize something in their mind that's not even true, or it just contributes to this culture of taboo, that this is a topic that's unspoken that we don't really mention and can lead to feelings of shame. Again, that feeling of difference, of weirdness, of I'm a freak, um, that social anxiety that can develop just because it's not, um, not spoken about. And then, of course, our big, the big A word, avoidance in social anxiety, just like in you know, good old fashioned social anxiety, when there's a medical condition in the picture, we often see avoidance of school, of work, of social gatherings, of parties, transportation, um, oftentimes because of fears about not being able to get to care if needed. Things like airplanes can be very anxiety provoking for that reason. Or if there's a medical condition where there's some, um, you know, need to be able to access a restroom and or urgency issues, then there can be a lot of avoidance behavior around that. Um, and for the most part, the pattern that we see is increased medical utilization because of that reassurance seeking uh, need where patients may be going to doctor's appointments or going to the ER frequently to get checked out um, to the point that it's unnecessary. Occasionally, though, we do see avoidance on the kind of on the flip side where patients may actually avoid going to their doctor's appointments because they're having a sort of socially anxious fear of what their doctor will say, of having to tell their doctor they're not taking their medications or they're otherwise not adherent to their medical regimen, um, or and just having to talk about their illness in general or confront it. So occasionally we do see the flip side of that sort of avoidance, which obviously has a lot of 
negative implications for their medical care and their course of illness. So I'm gonna speak a little bit more specifically about GI disorders um, and talk about how we address um, uh, some of these issues we've just talked about, but using this as a context. And I use GI as an example because it's one of the most common um, areas where we see anxiety. There's a huge co-occurrence of the two types of symptoms. Um, and we have a pretty robust um, literature on the use of cognitive behavioral therapy um, in these populations. So I'm going to speak a little bit about that. And this is this has a youth bent to it because I'm a pediatric provider. But um, so when we when we think about anxiety and GI disorders specifically, there and we you know when you look at the data for folks coming in to kids coming into a pediatric GI clinic. It's almost a staggering amount that are endorsing anxiety symptoms for those that have abdominal pains or functional abdominal pain, meaning there's no other kind of identifiable um, organic cause for it, up to 85%, um, which is huge. And anxiety has been found to be to predict maintenance of symptoms over time. It's been found to be associated with long-term problems with pain. And most interestingly, I think, is it's found to um, be more related to functional impairment, even so, more so than the pain itself is. So it clearly has a very profound effect. And I should say, it's not just those who have functional abdominal pain. Even those folks that do have some sort of organic cause to it, anxiety can exacerbate it. Um, so I always tell patients that even if it's not the root etiology, it's it's still a factor at play here. And that really gets at that biopsychosocial model. And that's really how we conceptualize this kind of intersection of um, physiological symptoms or physiological influence that in turn is impacted by emotions, mood, that's in turn impacted by the environment. And it's really kind of cyclical and, and intersectional in nature. In GI specifically, oftentimes it's referred to as the brain-gut access. In other areas, you might hear it referred to as the mind-body connection, all kind of meaning the same thing, that what's going on in your gut physiologically impacts how you feel, impacts what you do, and then in turn, your thoughts and your emotions about what you're feeling impacts your gut. So it's all cyclical. And the other concept that's really important to know about, particularly when it comes to pain, this is um, GI specific and just in general, because this could be musculoskeletal pain or otherwise, this idea of visceral hypersensitivity, which is basically just a fancy way of saying that over time, we get a decreased threshold for pain. And we start to experience what are just normal, benign sensations in our body as painful or as dangerous or as threatening. So um, there's lots of aches and pains and gurgles and things that go on, our, on in our body on a daily basis that probably don't mean much. But when we start to interpret them as scary or as bad or as indicative of something catastrophic, then they start to exacerbate and, um, and can worsen. So I like to do this little exercise with patients where I have them pay attention to their, bring all of their attention to one body part. Usually I use your fingertips because it's just a random body part. We don't think about much, but I'll tell them, think about your fingertips, bring all of your attention to them and think about how they feel. We're just going to focus our mind on our fingertips. Just notice if your mind wanders, bring them back. What does it feel like? How do, they, how do the tips of your fingers feel compared to other parts of your body? Just think about them. And after a minute, we'll say, what did you notice? And inevitably, people say, well, my fingertips feel kind of tingly. Or they feel sort of numb or I feel like I can feel my heartbeat in my fingertips. And I'll say, uh oh, do you think this is 
a new problem that just developed right here as we were looking at our fingertips and everybody gets it. No, of course, that it was probably always there. I just wasn't noticing it because I never pay attention to my fingertips. And then I'll ask, do we think it's a problem? Should we go to the fingertip doctor? And no, of course, it's benign. It doesn't mean anything. The tingling is probably just, I don't know, some weird thing that's there all the time and we don't really pay attention to. But it's a good illustration of how imagine that's your stomach or that's your back or your head. And you can start to really worry a lot more about one given sensation. So this this concept of hypervigilance, where um, we usually use we use this term a lot with um, with PTSD or trauma, but we mean this more of sort of in a physical hypervigilance way, of where we're constantly instead of scanning our environment for danger, we're scanning our body for danger, and we're paying a lot of attention to these sensations, to what might be a benign sensation or likely a benign sensation, and then we start to interpret them as dangerous or worrisome. Um, and then what happens when we start to feel stressed about our body? It increases those sensations. Our heart rate gets even you know, faster. We get even more short of breath. You can see this is very similar to the panic cycle. Um, it, it's kind of the same idea here. And we see this a lot. I work a lot with youth with concussions. And so they're experiencing a lot of headaches, a lot of dizziness, and it is very similar to that panic cycle where they have a headache, they think, oh no, there's something wrong with my brain, I did some permanent damage, the headache gets worse, it kind of gives them more proof that there's something wrong with their head, which makes the headache worse, and around the cycle we go. And this is this process is often kind of paired with that excessive information seeking or reassurance seeking, you know, the going on the WebMD, the looking up information where inevitably patients find a catastrophic interpretation for, you know, the headache means you have a brain tumor or um, the chest pain means you're having a heart attack um, or, you know, I like this example, you scraped your knee, you have cancer. So um, that really just fuels that anxiety process. So we talk a lot about the pain-stress connection, how pain causes stress, stress causes more pain, and around the loop we go. So this is a GI example. You wake up with nausea, think, oh, I'm not going to be able to take that test today, feel even more nauseous thinking about missing the test, maybe you even vomit, and then you feel more stressed about that. Now I'm falling behind in school and I'm not going to go at all. So a helpful approach in addressing this kind of this hypervigilance and pain stress connection with patients is talking with them about the stress response and particularly the sympathetic nervous system and how when we are stressed there are a lot of changes physiologically that happen our heart rate goes up our blood pressure goes up there are changes to our respiration um, cortisol is released into our bloodstream mood changes, cognition changes, where we have impaired judgment, where our attention is compromised. So there's really, you know, no organ system that is spared from neurological, dermatological, cardiovascular, GI, et cetera. They're really all quite impacted by stress. And this is where talking with patients about sometimes stress or anxiety might be kind of the etiology of a of a medical condition or symptom, like in functional abdominal pain, or it might be more of a maintaining factor um, where with asthma, there's some true, you know, organic symptoms there and anxiety is probably making it a lot worse. We see this a lot with our kids who have allergies where they, they're worried about contamination and fears and they will start to get red and rashy, but to, you know, due to anxiety rather than some sort of contamination. Okay. So I thought we'd move into speaking about CBT um, and how we kind of apply and adapt CBT for social anxiety when it's going on in the backdrop or in the context of a chronic medical illness. And like I mentioned before, we have a really robust um, literature supporting the use of CBT with GI disorders, with headaches and migraines. Now CBT has been, CBT has been kind of adapted um, very widely and applied to a variety of pain conditions, um, musculoskeletal pain and the like. 
and has you know, really impressive treatment effects that range from decreased pain and medical symptoms to decreased medication use, um, improved functional um, impairment, improved quality of life, improved coping, uh, even caregiver changes as well. So when we think about CBT for medical conditions, we have our good old fashioned CBT triangle that doesn't change. What changes might be the trigger. It might be a physical symptom or a medical appointment or a upcoming surgery or something like that. And then our anxious thought, uh, social anxiety, can't face meeting with my boss like this. He's going to think there's something really strange going on with me. I'm going to be doubled over in pain, feeling anxious, feeling depressed, stay home from work. So again, we're working to change these around. I'm sure I'll feel better once I'm moving around. My boss probably isn't going to be even really noticing, feel calm, go to work. And the first step, like always, is psychoeducation. So we'll teach patients about that biopsychosocial, that pain stress cycle, draw it out, have them kind of identify those um, parts of the cycle for themselves. And all the while highlighting, these are not distinct um, phenomenon. It's not like we have medical over here and we have psychological over here and we're trying to parse out what's what. They're, they're really all intertwined um, and thread together. I like the example of hunger here because we all can, we all kind of understand that hunger comes from both our stomach and our brain, right? There's signals that are going back and forth and pain is the same way. Um, and that's how pain is processed in the body as well. So relaxation strategies, um, you know, are, are very helpful, particularly with, um, with folks who have that autonomic arousal that's associated with their medical condition. So um, we get lots of kids who have kind of heart palpitations. And so obviously this is a really useful tool for them to be able to use progressive muscle relaxation, guided imagery, um, all the classics are helpful here. And I really emphasize to them that this is both to help anxiety, both to help your body physically calm down from the stress of whatever worry you're having, but also for your medical condition, because pain and stress, right, are processed in that same way. So if we can take our, uh, you know, our parasympathetic nervous kind of activation down, that's going to hopefully help with, in this way, help with your stomach pain or your dizziness or what have you. So um, belly breathing, um, emphasizing that pain stress connection, progressive muscle relaxation, all important here. But I want to spend the most time on the cognitive interventions because I think this is where where the money is um, for socially anxious thoughts in, in folks that have some sort of medical thing going on. And usually the cognitive distortions that we see are about their symptoms, about the implications of their symptoms, the impact that their medical condition will have on their activities or, or how other people are perceiving their activities and their symptoms or what they look like. Um, in the midst of these symptoms. So for example, I have a teenage girl who I treat who has epilepsy and she's very worried about having a seizure in public. Uh, what will I look like? Will I be drooling? Will I be incontinent? Um, there's a lot of fears around that piece of it. Um, and depending on the medical diagnosis, you know, those vi the visibility of it can vary quite a bit. Um, so using evidence finding, decatastrophizing to reframe these thoughts and to develop more accurate and adaptive thought patterns is helpful. And then having our good coping thoughts on hand. So like we know with social anxiety, we, that causes us to overestimate danger, risk, and threat. And this is where it's a little tricky because like I was talking about on one of those first slides, there is a real danger, risk, or threat associated with most medical illnesses. So having a seizure, that is a, a real threat. Um, you know, cancer, uh, progress in a progression of disease, that is a real threat that 
sometimes we can't just evidence find a way um, and, and, you know, totally reframe of like, oh no, that'll never happen. Um, but it doesn't mean that it's not workable. Oftentimes there is still an exaggerated fear in response. Um, you can often go to, has this happened before? Yes, you have had a seizure before and it wasn't fun, but you coped with it. So that gets to that second piece here, that underestimation of our ability to cope. Um, and sometimes even just playing out those worst case scenarios of, um, you know, a lot of folks with GI conditions who are worried about having accidents publicly and we play it out. Okay. What would we do? Really? How would we problem solve around that? If that happened, we could, you know, we can argue all day about the likelihood that it'll happen, but let's, let's figure out how we cope with that. Um, and sometimes you have a little bit more room to move the thoughts around that. So our same kind of line of Socratic questioning, how likely is this to happen? What's happened before? How would you cope? What are alternate explanations? Oftentimes there's a lot of interpreting that goes on with, well, you know, my, I'm having a lot of headaches today. I'm worried that means my concussion is getting worse. Um, I couldn't pay attention in school today. I think it's probably because of my concussion I had two months ago. Well, what, what could it have been hard to pay attention in school today? Like, what are you learning about in algebra class? That sounds kind of boring. Um, has it, was it ever hard to pay attention before you had a concussion? And try to reattribute what that sensation or that symptom that they're focused on to something other than the medical illness can sometimes be helpful too. And then that, that hypervigilance, that idea of misinterpreting the sensation. I always tell patients that the goal is not to get, my goal is not to get rid of the physical sensation. I wish that I could, but I probably don't have that power in me. And it's probably not realistic because we're all going to experience lots of different physical sensations at different times. So it's not necessarily that we're trying to get rid of the nausea that causes the thought, oh no, I'm going to throw up in front of the whole class and everyone's going to laugh at me. So then I feel anxious. I scan for more nausea. So lo and behold, I notice more nausea and my thoughts get worse. The goal is to reframe the interpretation, right? My stomach is fine and you exit stage right out of this cycle. Um, so you see very similar to panic here. We're just changing. We're not saying you're never going to feel dizzy. You're never going to feel like your heart racing. We're just changing the interpretation of it right here. So some of those themes I was mentioning that are common um, in social anxiety with chronic medical illness are, like I said, appearance. So um, I think particularly true if you're working with adolescents where there might already be a heightened kind of perception and focus on appearance. But I hear this a lot in our kids with diabetes who have a pump. Um, like I look like a freak. People are going to stare at me or, um, you know, wonder what this is. And so we kind of reframe it with this idea of people are really not noticing or not paying attention. Um, my hair loss, it just screams, I have cancer, or I'm a cancer patient, and others are not focused on my hair would be kind of the reframe that we go to there. Um, everyone can tell I have an ostomy bag, sort of feeling like that magical thinking everybody knows um, that no one is paying attention to this. People don't have x-ray vision. Um, the, the theme of um, sort of be feeling different or feeling excluded, feeling um, other is a big one we talked about as well. So this conflation of their illness with their identity can happen at times. Like oh, people just think I'm the girl with diabetes in the class or I'm the girl with epilepsy and it, we can do some reframing on, well, has anyone actually called you that? Or, um, you know, are there other things that you're sort of known for in your peer group? You, have, you were the lead in the school musical. I think people are probably more focused on that than your diabetes. Um, no one's ever called me that. So again, I'm doing a lot of evidence finding around that. Um, this idea of kind of socially missing out FOMO. I've missed so much school. Everyone has their groups. Like I'm too late. It's kind of not worth it. Um, it's not too late to make friends. There's always an opportunity. Um, other people think it's depressing to be around me. I hear this 
for um, a lot with folks who have more severe illness, like cancer, where they feel like I don't want to bring everybody down. I don't, I'm not going to even bother to like FaceTime my friend. They're just going to be depressed to see me sitting in the hospital, um, reminding them that that's why they're your friends because they're there for you. They like hanging out with you. Last time they visited, you guys were joking around and smiling. Um, again, just trying to poke at that um, logic. And then the restriction of activity is a big one as well, where we see the avoidance with social anxiety. So, oh, my buddies are going out golfing, but I've got this like back pain. I, it's not even worth going. I'm not going to be able to play. Um, and having a little bit of all or nothing thinking around either like I go and I play 18 holes or I sit home on my couch. And this idea of like, I'll oh, just go some gray area. I can go, I can ride along the golf cart. That's the most fun part anyways. Um, and, you know, be with my friends. So being a little flexible and in, in how we're defining participation um, can be helpful. Uh, I can't go on this car ride because I'll be away from a bathroom. Never actually had an accident before. Everyone will think it's weird that I'm sitting out of gym class and maybe everybody's looking at me. Everyone's focused on me, judging me. Other kids really don't care. They're not noticing. Kids sit out all the time because they have a broken wrist or a this or that, and no one's really focused on me. Um, so I like to, I teach um, patients about the imaginary audience, this concept that there's this heightened feeling that everybody's watching us, everyone's noticing us, and that we're kind of the, we're on a stage, we're the main focus of other people's attention, and that this is a fallacy, this is not true. And I like doing little exercises with them of like, what color was your best friend's shirt wear, that they were wearing yesterday, or what did your brother eat for lunch yesterday? What did you eat for lunch yesterday? What kind of shoes was your teacher wearing, your colleague wearing? You know, we can never remember, right? We can't remember these about ourselves, let alone other people, which gives them that little bit of perspective of, oh, maybe not everybody's looking at my diabetes insulin pump. You know, maybe everybody isn't really focused on me sitting out of gym class because they're focused on how they look in gym class and if they're doing something weird. Um, so it's a nice little opportunity to do some protective, um, some perspective taking. And then lastly is exposure, um, which we can't forget. So oh, the avoidance cycle with social anxiety and illness is huge. Um, it can contribute to deconditioning where the less folks do, the more or pain they develop at lower levels. And it really fuels that social, the, the social fears or the social worries because they don't get a corrective learning experience that, oh, it was fine. I went on the car trip and nothing bad happened. Or I went out to eat and nobody cared that I had to order something special off the menu because of my dietary restrictions. Like, nobody blinked. Um, so we work to gradually expose patients to these avoided situations. Oftentimes it's doing activities in the context of increasingly bothersome symptoms. So maybe they used to stay home from work anytime they had a little headache and now we're actually encouraging them to go and do some activity pacing and take some breaks, but try to tolerate it so they don't get too deconditioned. Um, even feared foods that they're worried will induce certain symptoms or being away from a bathroom for increasing longer periods of time. Again, these are GI related ones. Um, and then these are just some examples. This example of a fear hierarchy we might use with somebody with diabetes. Um, oftentimes there's anxiety, social anxiety about checking in blood glucose in front of other people. Like, oh, they're gonna get creeped out. There's a needle, there's a little blood. Like, oh, they think it's so gross. Or when I was in second grade, a kid commented that I, you know, was a vampire and I've never read over it. So um, being able to work with that of like, first go to the school nurse and check there. And then maybe tell your friend that you're going to the school nurse and then maybe um, check it at your desk or somewhere when there's like one person in the class and then in a busy class. So working your way up or with the pump, this is a big one, a lot where, you know, to wear a pump on usually it's like on their arm somewhere um where maybe it's like first covered by a long sleeve shirt and then sort of covered by short sleeves and then with a tank top so increasing the visibility and having that corrective learning experience that oh nobody judged me for that or 
you know, oftentimes if kids, especially little kids do get questions of what's on your arm, we do a lot of work around a question does not equal negative judgment. A question might just equal curiosity. Um, and again, kind of um, detaching those two concepts um, because little kids do tend to ask questions and preparing them for how having some scripts that they can use to answer. So we, I often talk with kids and adults alike about you might have a different script that you say to the guy on the elevator than you do your best friend or your colleague. So having those readily available helps them to feel more prepared so they're not put on the spot, especially this time of year, back to school is a big time where there's a kind of influx of these sort of questions and, um, you know, having some, having practiced out loud, what do you say? If somebody's like, well, why are you wearing that? Or why do you have to wear it with epilepsy? Oftentimes people have those bracelets that um, kind of, uh, those safety bracelets. Um, why do you, you know, what is that for? Um, and even just kind of wearing them more visibly can be good exposures to do. Um, I think we'll hold off on the case and maybe see if we have any questions. Awesome. Thank you so much, Corinne. That was fantastic. Let's go ahead and, and open it up for questions if anybody has any. And I know, Shmuel, I, I see your question in the chat too. Um, so we can start there. Or if anybody has questions that they want to ask now, please go for it. Sure. Thank you, Yeah, I can, hop, I can read out what he wrote. Um, he said he has a call with a mom this morning about her 10-year-old son with extensive medical history that triggered choking, allergic reactions, and vomiting, all real. In and out of hospitals and intense medical procedures, now though they are concerned that vomiting and reactions to food is less medical and more due to sensitivity and conditioning. And he rolls his eyes after so many have taught him to deep breathe. However, there is minimal to zero presence of typical anxiety symptoms. And he gives off a very resilient presentation. Would love to learn more about this cross-section. Oh, very interesting. I, um, too bad I didn't get to the case because it was about a young woman who choked on chicken and, um, had a lot of subsequent fear of something getting stuck, of choking again, particularly in front of other people. So didn't want to eat in public, um, didn't, you know, would eat really liquidy things. Um, and part of what the, I think part, I think where, where the money might be with this example, where there's not a lot of kind of express typical anxiety or worries or fear is that deconditioning piece. And there might be, you might be able to get some buy-in there of, look, like you have this really scary thing. I don't know if they for a while had to avoid any, you know, particular types of food, but you have to kind of work back up your tolerance of what you can eat and what feels safe to you. Um, looking to see if I missed anything else of your yeah I'll I actually I have I have two minutes to be able to jump in this is great I thank you um I mean there's just it, the, the hard part just listening to her was like you've you've mentioned is like what's what's the what's the real what's what's the not and he has I forget the name of it it is not a common condition it's like white cells in his stomach and his esophagus that do they've gone through different lots of different trials of things to try yeah. to try to treat it where it does create the choking and the mm -hmm. uh, and the vomiting, yeah. so there's something like there, it. It is really, really there. Um, but then at this point, he just like and he won't even tell anyone. He'll like he's he'll like leave class and he'll he'll just go vomit and then just go back to class and yeah. and the, so the insight is or the desire to really really like do something. But now he's like, there's so much food that he he'll he'll avoid and yeah. Yeah, I don't know. Well, I never I, met with them. It was just a conversation with them all. I commend him for going back to class and not going home. That's great. <laughs> um, I, I, um, you know, I found that really trying, you know, over years, I think I've become less attached to trying to kind of convince somebody this is anxiety. This is so clearly anxiety, and and just even leaning back from that a little bit and going like, okay. Even if this is all medical, these same interventions are what we would use to kind of build back up that tolerance, almost in a PT type of analogy. So sometimes I use an analogy like a marathoner 
breaks their leg, they're off their feet for six weeks, the first time they go back running, they're going to be really sore. And does that mean that's bad? Like they should never run again? No. I mean, that just means they need to build back up and do one mile and then two miles and then three miles. And this is the same way. Like you had this really scary choking thing. You were vomiting or, um, and your body's just not used to eating in that typical way or that way you did baseline. So we just have to slowly kind of build back up your body's tolerance for whatever kinds of foods that he feels like induce symptoms. Um, and, and that's kind of your sneaky way to do exposures, um, without him saying, yes, I'm really anxious about this. Right. Right. Okay. Thank you. Yeah. Randy, go for it. Could I make a little, um, contribution here? I mm -hmm. just want to comment on, on Shmuel's, um, issue. And, and I have it on the other end of the spectrum, usually with older or geriatric patients with Parkinson's or this or that. But um, I would try and zero in as much as I could on um, the feared social outcome from the symptom. I would really try and drill down to what is the child, which, which sometimes is tricksy, as you know, um, what is the feared... Um, symptom and what do they think is going to happen and then I would try to in the least threatening way to start design um, our typical experiments around it and maybe even shmuel a paradoxical in in if possible a very unthreatening scenario first like not around friends but a little a restaurant where there are, are not people I know or I would that's how I would try to uh, yeah, I agree. I think the tricky part with him in particular is like the mom and and I I I've come across this child like in like whatever extensive circles, and she's like, if you would see him, like you would think he's he's total he he poo poos he plays it off. So it's not like he's he's not he's not going to say like there's this consequence. He's really not. So I agree with what you know what you were saying earlier about. You know, maybe not even say, oh, I'm not trying to convince you. I mean, again, I'm not working with him. But mm -hmm. in, in theory, I'd say, oh, you have anxiety mm -hmm. because he'll he'll be like, yeah, no, I know he might. But he, he certainly he certainly won't say he'll he'll just like, yeah, I just got to go. Mom and I'll be back and like, OK, what's the big deal? Like he's right. a very he's a gregarious kid to begin with. Now, the mom said there is some social. I think there, there probably is some social anxiety there, but he he has this like personality like. He'll play it off. And if you don't really know him, you won't think that anything is going on. Mm -hmm. Although there is. Yeah. That's very interesting and tough. I also think sometimes we're in the world of um, medical stuff, like aligning, I, I think of aligning with their presenting complaint, their present, presenting medical complaint. Oftentimes I'm seeing kids in the context of a medical clinic, a GI clinic, a neurology clinic, where they didn't come in and say, I have social anxiety, please help me. They're here saying, no, I have abdominal pain. Um, like, why are you in here talking to me? And so we're really framing all of these interventions. Sometimes I'll even call them non-pharmacological treatment for your abdominal pain. And it that feels different than therapy for your abdominal pain, or we think this is anxiety induced or stress induced, where they get a lot of, no, 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 it's not, it's pain. Um, and this, like, you know, these are connected. So sometimes that's another entryway. Thank you, Randy. I appreciate the input. Other questions? Andy, I saw your video come on. Did you have a question? Oh, you're muted. That's okay. Yeah, I just came back. <laughs> okay, cool. So I have a question. Um, I have lots of clients with gut issues. Where do you, I usually, you know, I have my standard way of approaching it, but I'm just wondering about the newest research and do you have some links for us to follow up and dig in if we need more information? Sure. Yeah, there's, um, there is a kind of trans-diagnostic, uh, one of the treatments that work uh, pain protocol that I really like because you can apply it to headaches, to stomach aches, to lots of diffuse complaints. 
And, um, and it, it's really kind of all the core interventions, but presented in, I think, a very kind of palatable way. Um, the newest research I find is very interesting, and it's almost more about offering CBT earlier um, to kids with medical illnesses, almost as like an inoculation for developing persisting symptoms. So instead of waiting for to go through these lengthy, expensive, invasive workups and then go up oh, like you are actually there's nothing organic going on here. It's just anxiety. And then referring somebody for CBT. Why don't we actually like reverse that order a little bit or at least move the CBT up if we can, even if it's in a really brief abbreviated fashion, because um, we don't have side effects really that we think of, um, except for making kids uncomfortable during exposure. Um, and if we can do it in an you know, at an earlier entry point, we all know the benefits of earlier intervention. So it's, I, I really like the term inoculation because it, it shows how if you can give kids some strategies early on, it has this benefit of preventive, this preventative benefit. Um, so they're doing, they're doing that with concussions a little bit of kind of having every, any kid who comes in with a concussion gets a few CBT skills um, and see where that takes you. Obviously, you know, physicians need to do workups to ensure that they're not missing something, but um, there becomes a point of diminishing returns with the workup. You seem to be surrounded by parents who are really good at research. And I live in Houston, where you can get medical uh, experts on almost everything. So they come to me as one of the many things that they're doing, and I'm trying to educate them that maybe the gut issues and the anxiety are part, mm -hmm. part of the same thing, but it's like, no, 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 we're going to go do it. So that's why I'm thinking, well, a little research here and there, maybe. Yeah. Maybe tell them to do a little research into the CBT, GI, uh, gut issues, like literature, because it's, um, it's very, I mean, and it, it goes back a ways now to the eighties. Um, there's a lot of support for CBT, you know, even pediatric patients with functional abdominal pain. So it also, sometimes I get to, well, two things. One, if somebody has a chronic condition, I always tell them like, you are the expert on your disease. I am never going to be, I don't work in one particular division. I, I'm, I work across the board. So I'm not an epilepsy expert. I'm not a diabetes expert. They are going to by far, you know, far and away, no more than I do. Um, I'm just a CBT expert and can tell you how this can help with, you know, kind of more broadly. Um, but also I think sometimes, you know, that idea of the most parsimonious explanation is the most accurate one of you've got, you've done this big workup um, and there's, there's no, it hasn't revealed any significant findings where we have a pharmacotherapy for it. And you've got anxiety. We know anxiety, we've got all this data to show anxiety can cause these issues. Just makes sense that it would be anxiety, not some other very rare condition that they haven't caught yet. Um, not always convincing. To me, that sounds convincing, but sometimes it is. Thank you so much. This is really important, uh, an important topic. I appreciate your, your help with it today. Awesome. And I'm looking at the time, so I think it's probably a good time to go ahead and wrap up. But thank you, Corinne. This has been so helpful and so informative, and we really appreciate you taking the time to speak with us today. Thanks, Taylor. Thanks for having me, everybody. Awesome. Bye, everybody. Thank you for being here.